to start. So I should uh, welcome the other speakers. So Diego and Manuel, if you could please open your camera so we may start. So welcome uh, to another webinar of Agroecology Europe. We are going to slowly start uh, with uh, the current webinar on a very interesting topic, I guess, which uh, combines different uh, terminologies of uh, major interest, at least uh, for the agricultural sector, like technological innovations and agroecological transition. Uh, we are going to start with uh, presenting the speakers. Today we have, uh, we're glad to have together with us uh, some of uh, some actors involved in, uh, let's say, technological or otherwise digital innovations developed for agriculture. So I would like to welcome Diego Guidotti from uh, Italy, from the Edit Company, and Emanuele Ranieri. <clears throat> working again from uh, Agricolus. They are going to present us some of their uh, recent work with uh, digital tools that we have developed related to agroecology, as well as uh, Alecos Pandazis, the receptor from the peer to peer lab, among other things. Or we're going to see how different open source tools are developed for uh, small scale farming. Uh, I should remind that this. Uh, um, Webinars are organized by Agroecology Europe Association. I guess more or less the, those attending previous webinars already know the background and the activities of Agroecology Europe. Of course, you can visit the web platform of the association in the agroecologyeurope.org webpage. I should remember that I remind you that uh, the association is, of course, has an open membership. So you are uh, always welcome to participate as members, uh, even if you are like students or farmers. Uh, so you'll be up to date and uh, you'll get the uh, network with other uh, stakeholders of agroecology all over Europe. I will remind again that uh, the previous uh, webinars held by Agroecology Europe are, are can be found in the web page. It's already 10 or 11 of them already held within the previous month. Many of them are in very, in very, on very interesting topics. So I would also suggest that the uh, attendants could also visit and uh, see the previous um, webinars that were held up to now. And I will take also the opportunity to uh, promote, communicate with you the next uh, forum of Agroecology Europe that will take place in November in the city of Barcelona. It has been already cancelled uh, once because due to the pandemic conditions. So there is a new date now from 20 to sorry from 18 to 20 of November, and there is also an open call for contributions until the end of this month, until 31st of May. In the case, if you would like to suggest maybe to contribute with a session or a workshop on uh, that can be presented on the forum. The forum, I should also mention, that it will be held both in person and in, uh, in a digital way. Uh, getting now to the point, as I said, uh, agroecological innovation, uh, sorry, technological innovation is, a, is a, let's say, a major trend nowadays, the last years for agriculture, as uh, especially as it matters the digital innovations. Agroecology Europe Association has been already being placed regarding uh, several topics that they are of interest for agroecology, or they are, let's say, under a debate on how they could be, uh, what will be the place and the position of agroecology towards these uh, very specific uh, approaches. So I would like to introduce you some very recent scientific publications on this, like um, the Controversial Topics in Agroecology that was published uh, actually last year. Also, the other uh, publications, like from the High Panel of Experts on Agroecological and other innovative approaches, where um, several aspects of uh, technological and specifically digital innovations have been analyzed in terms of the compatibility of them towards the agroecological transition uh, to develop truly sustainable food systems. There's also some other scientific publications 
uh, position papers actually that uh, propose specific uh, specific approaches and the proposal how we can actually stand towards these technological innovations. Actually, some of the today's webinar will be based on, uh, on the top of our, uh, paper that I am just showing to you. And of course, there are other kind of publications already in other kind of uh, media uh, dealing with this very specific topic. I will be fast on this because what I would like to show you is that this is a topic of interest, and I'm sure that we have um, also debatable topic. But I'm going to show you today why it's, uh, there's such a, let's say, controversial opinions about it. Uh, already since 2017, there's been a workshop in the first uh, Agroecology Europe Forum held in Lyon, where there has been some output out of this regarding a, a position, but also some um, conclusions of how we could deal with all these technological innovations within the agroecological approach. So getting now to the point, I would like to make a short introduction. I will not exhaust the whole issue about the agroecological approach. I would just like to remind the attendants that uh, already agroecology, and I'm showing here the 10 elements of agroecology as are presented by FAO, already integrates several aspects like uh, talking about synergies, it's about the uh, processes of co-creation and sharing of knowledge. This is very important. Also, you can see the recent 13 principles of agroecology by a recent publication of uh, Alexander Vettel of 2020, where we do see that similar words are used to frame how we can move toward the, the so-called agroecological transition. We talk again about co-creation of knowledge, about synergies, and uh, also participatory approaches, social values, uh, social values, etc. Uh, I will remind here for those not really familiar with agroecology that already proposes that the transition towards truly sustainable uh, food systems uh, integrates several steps. It's not, not one day, one step process. So it talks about increase of efficiency of the food systems then talks about the process of substitution, substitution substituting uh, synthetic inputs with, a, let's say, more uh, organic based on agrobiodiversity. Of course, also reducing the dependency of uh, inputs. And then the most important is that incorporate the final stage of redesigning the whole food system. However, it's important here to stress that uh, this whole process of transition it's uh, characterized as a knowledge intensive process and really accepts that innovative frameworks, tools, and technologies, which are always redirected towards more, let's say, sustainability principles, could be potentially used. This is very important uh, because we'll see that the so called environmental or ecological modernization of uh, agriculture, the recent days, is, let's say, two different kinds of uh, intensities a lighter intensity, where we just uh, we stress mostly the increase of the resource, the efficiency of resource, uh, of use of resources, or even recycling uh, byproducts or wastes. But the most, the more robust, the more agroecological uh, modernization, kind of modernization of agriculture, is based on using several ecosystem, agroecosystem services, biodiversity. That's why we, many times, we call it biodiversity-based agriculture. Uh, so now talking about all different ecological innovations that already are developed or applied in agriculture, we can now differentiate it in uh, two different let's say, categories, although the high-tech one is the most, most prevalent one, talking about digital innovations at first place, uh, which are actually top placed among the technological suggestions, propositions for agriculture. There we talk about <clears throat> technologies and tools that maybe are more or less it's uh, upon us uh, nowadays. We talk about ICT platforms, the use of big data, Internet of Things like drones, robotics, whatever. But of course, also we have the, let's say, the traditional technological innovations. We talk about classical tools used in agriculture or even breeding techniques or whatever. So what I want to say here is that we already have all these different innovations, however, the high tech, let's say, innovation nowadays in the narration, <coughs> the mainstream narration, narrative of um, 
of innovation in agriculture, it really dominates with a small comment here, having lots of plenty uh, of technological optimism, optimism integrated. Uh, also, if we noted the last years, I mean, the whole concept of sustainability sometimes is somehow <clears throat> being characterized, uh, connected with uh, this kind of digital innovations. I'm just showing you here several examples of recent uh, forums or uh, conferences where they stress how more novel technological innovations can um, move towards agriculture, towards sustainability. And of course, there are plenty of examples, hundreds of examples all over the world of uh, all these new technologies applied or dominating the, start dominating the, let's say, the technological market in agriculture. Of course, things are a little bit contradictory. Uh, we just do see uh, several cases where, um, where give, uh, they, give, they gave rise to a strong debate about how this innovation should be integrated in agriculture. There are several cases, like, for example, the use of big data and how they are used by major, let's say, technological actors, players, market players all over the world. So I'm just giving here an example of an article about how uh, big technological uh, providers, technology providers in agriculture are using the big data. And uh, I would like also to stress, because it's important, that uh, also policymakers, also in the European Union and globally, through the rural development policies, so do support research topics that facilitate all this ecosystem of uh, major technology players, like manufacturers, even researchers, etc., to create a new economic sector, a new value out of uh, all these uh, app applications for uh, agriculture. Yeah. And also shown here that we're using the voice of the European Union to enable the market players to extract value from this data. I also include here all these new technologies. However, as uh, it was uh, previously mentioned, there are several weaknesses and risks that should be highlighted here. So, uh, for those already involved in this, uh, let's say, in this area of technological innovations, have already, especially those also connected to agroecology, have already indicated that uh, there are several weaknesses. For example, they do stress that there is a kind of technocentric a top-down approach from major market players to the end users, which are the farmers, that maybe create some economic dominance and supervision that will be concentrated in few players, few market players. Again, the whole, the whole, all these technological innovations are very market-oriented. And they incorporate some high cost for farmers in order to adapt them, and of course require some initial large investments, both in time and uh, working uh, electric capacity, but also capital. And of course, from the agroecological point of view, there's also stress that there is a risk that they continue to support, let's say, these productivity-oriented approaches, which are more interventionist and, let's say, therapeutic, in the sense of talking about uh, reducing the, uh, the external inputs in agriculture, and they mostly focus on improving the efficiency. And there's also the case of the, the whole supply chains, which also promote more aggregated marketplaces and platforms. So all this have, have given uh, rise to several criticism because uh, it appears that all these technological innovations, especially the novel ones, the digital ones, mostly promote, uh, let's say, technology transfer models that they don't really promote the experience-based exchange of knowledge, also based in long-term observation of ecological processes, something that the agroecological approach stresses. And again, it's about the whole issue of the top-down, let's say, structure of the whole market, that they are mostly, mostly centered on the technology developers, and they consider the end user, the farmer, Let's say, like the like the market will be only accepting as the customer. Let's say these uh, technologies. And of course, it, the development of this, uh, the implementation of these technological innovations, the novel ones especially, 
kind of ignore the dependencies of farmers to this, to the technology itself, but also to the providers of technology. So this is uh, recognized that creates a kind of asymmetrical power of relationships. Well, there is a lot of nice words here. I mean, this is the bottom line is, and this is the, also the the topic of the today's webinar, the core, the heart of the today's webinar. Is this technological innovation actually fitting within the agroecological approach? Let's try to see this a little bit. I mean, we should remember that agroecology as an approach in agriculture emphasizes some lots of independent experimentation, as well as co-creation and synergistic approaches, not just dependency of external suppliers, etc. However, on the other hand, Agroecology always supports, the, let's say, the inclusiveness instead of exclusiveness, inclusive approaches, having many different actors and, uh, and stakeholders in order to catalyze the innovation uh, process. So it really promotes synergies for some, in order to see how we can integrate all these different, let's say, uh, proposals, propositions from the from technology. So. All these technologies are not actually opposing the heart itself of uh, agroecology, the main core of agroecology. It's actually, and I say this uh, expresses now also the opinion of, uh, uh, let's say, associations like Agroecology Europe, but it is recognized that all these um, either novel or traditional technologies can really support all these initial steps, as we saw, of the agroecological transition or even the, when they are fine-tuned with the agroecological principles, let's say an already redesigned system. Uh, however, it's, the point is how this, what kind of innovation, how the innovation should be developed. And here I would like to stress two things already, already mentioned in a previous paper, a uh, scientific publication I showed you before. Uh, we could say that all these new technologies could play a potential role for this transition to sustainable food systems when some uh, prerequisites are uh, met. And here I will borrow some definitions from the biggest, from the science data and socio-economical disciplines in science, talking about at first hand the user innovation process. Uh, what does it mean? It's a process that emphasizes the involvement of the end users, in our case, the market, sorry, the farmers, in order to develop tools and technologies. So this is a rather different approach from having just a manufacturer-centric model for all these products as developed by uh, some providers, some manufacturers in exclusive ways and that then they are delivered to the, the customers, let's call it, to the end users, the farmers. So the user innovation process also stresses the, let's say, the innovation in terms of uh, being in the hands of the farmers, of the end users, which are not just a participatory approach, but it's like a co-innovation approach. <clears throat> so we can, in the bottom line, we can say that this, all this democratizes the whole uh, process of innovation development. On the other hand, so there's another approach talking about a peer-to-peer -peer process within a so-called commons-based peer production model. So we talk about uh, some dynamic of human interactions, decentralized and non-hierarchical networks for communicating and uh, collaborating and also exchanging all these different innovation and values uh, created. Uh, so this can create, let's say, uh, a common pool of knowledge, tools, etc., that can also be, can be used for to further uh, to further develop further innovation. All right, I mean uh, maybe for some which is in agronomy or in agriculture, all these new definitions are a little bit, let's say, strange. However, we can see it like if we talk about real examples. So I will start now giving the uh, the word to the to our guest, saying that uh, there are there do Examples do exist in terms of open source agricultural technologies or collaborative projects that develop technology solutions and innovation for farmers and with farmers. And uh, as it was found from previous uh, collaborative projects, farmers do really highly appreciate such initiatives. Before giving the step now to Diego Vidotti, I will just have a small, uh, very short uh, time presenting 
some uh, examples from our uh, working team, from our, our research groups uh, here in Greece, like uh, decision support tools that, were, uh, that they, we have developed for calculating energy, greenhouse gas emissions in all the production systems. Very socialized, but it uh, also have a recent uh, scientific publication on this. These are the tools that they are uh, open for farmers to use, free of charge. It's also under Creative Commons uh, uh, copyright. And of course, you can download it from the site that you see here on the screen. We do continue working on this, uh, such tools. Nowadays, we have another project with other uh, uh, partners all over the Mediterranean. Uh, so, I'm giving now the step to Diego Guidotti, and then to Emanuele, and then to uh, Anieri, and then to Alekos Pandazis, where we can see different examples of such tools and, uh, collab and collaborations, creating uh, several technological innovations, either digital, novel, or traditional. This will take about another 40 to 45 minutes. And afterwards, we have a round table discussion where the participants of the webinar can also address questions by using the comments uh, in the Facebook that will be transferred to the speakers and have, a, let's say, a joint uh, discussion on this specific topic. So, Diego, I'm giving now the step. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Diego Guidotti from MyEdit, and uh, we present an experience, uh, uh, an app that has been developed uh, within uh, a EU project to support farmer in participatory soil earth monitoring. Uh, I am uh, I'm from Italy as a background. I am an agronomist. Uh, my PhD was uh, on uh, using uh, um, digital technology to support uh, uh, farm in pest management. And uh, uh, I've worked in the last 20 years in uh, co-designing solution uh, for farmers or for other, uh, for local authorities and uh, agronomists uh, in agriculture sector, and also to develop the decision super system. And uh, the, the app I present today has been created in a project that was uh, in a 2017 project that was called uh, Capsella. And uh, the idea of Capsella was to test uh, the co-design approach, a bottom-up participatory approach to develop some solution to support a uh, farmer in uh, managing uh, agrobiodiversity. And uh, the project was coordinated by Atina and uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. And uh, mm, there were several solutions that was developed in the, in the project. One of the solution was uh, the, 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 soil, uh, the soil app. Uh, uh, we started, there was a very interesting uh, um, uh, event uh, with uh, involving a lot of different stakeholders where several issues was raised to uh, how a digital solution can support uh, um, agrobiodiversity in farm and uh, agroecology practices. And uh, there were, you know, a lot of idea, but uh, a lot of it, one common aspect of several idea was the, the soil health management. So uh, this was one of solution that can be used, very basic, very simple, but can be a first approach just to uh, test how can we involve farmer in developing this type of solution. Uh, there were uh, three main communities that was involved uh, into the project. Uh, Ag Agilops from Greece, uh, that you probably know. Uh, Scuola Esperienziale, that is a network of farmers that work on uh, sharing experience and teaching uh, practices on uh, organic farming. And uh, a farmer association uh, in, uh, in Netherlands. So also different type of uh, community involved. And uh, the main topics of the app was to, uh, how can we support farmer in assess uh, soil health? and to evaluate how their practices uh, impact the soil. And uh, so, you know, there are several type of uh, uh, methodologies that you can use to, uh, to assess soil health. And uh, uh, we chose to start from uh, the very simple one. So starting from the spade test. So to do something that can be done uh, without any uh, tools, you need just a spade. 
and uh, uh, it is a first approach that is useful uh, for to do a self-assessment and also to be used to to teach a student and farmer how important is the the, the soil condition so uh, this is uh, the first step uh, the system can be integrated with more complex things we can discuss this later but we decide to start from something very basic and simple and this is also one uh, interesting thing so to develop usually starting from very simple things is a good way to start the interaction and so this is the app i can show you um very easily, but you can. I can give you later the, the contact. You can download the app and test by yourself. So the system uh, is a, 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 a tools that guide users step by step in evaluating a different type of uh, aspect related to the soil, starting from the surface. So analyze the surface, looking at this, and uh, try to figure out what can be the main issue about the surface and then uh, going uh, deep and analyzing all the other aspects. Uh, you can use the, apps, uh, the app uh, directly online. So if you go on uh, soilhealth.capsella.eu, uh, you can access a web version. You can use it both the browser or directly your mobile phone. And uh, with the mobile phone, uh, you can use also an app that usually work better also when there is not uh, you know, a good uh, uh, internet connection, you can use, uh, you can download the app and the, the app is able to work in also uh, offline. And uh, so this is the link to download, uh, to download the app. So when you enter the app, uh, you have a, a generic description, what you can you do. If you have already done uh, some other tests, you have a list of your uh, old tests and you can look again and share the tests that you have done. Then when you enter, uh, the system uh, uh, geolocates the position uh, and uh, you can uh, just uh, give a code and a name to the spade test and then you can proceed. So starting from the surface, uh, there are also uh, a set of uh, uh, plants that uh, can uh, support, it can be used as a proxy, as an indicator of some uh, uh, potential uh, feature uh, of the soil within. And then there is a small video showing how to take the sample, uh, then uh, um, asking some information about how tough is the, the soil, uh, try to estimate what will be the, the potential water content. Uh, and then the user is free to, this, to define what is the layer of the soil uh, that uh, he can recognize and uh, lay by layer to have uh, to answer just a, a short number of questions about structure. And then at the end, some information also about uh, uh, some animals that can be seen uh, in, the, in the soil. Also this kind of uh, bioindicator that can be used to assess uh, the soil health. And then at the end, uh, the user gets uh, uh, a summary of the data that has been collected. And this summary, uh, the user can choose to publish and share this data uh, within their own organization or uh, to the public. Uh, by default, the data will remain uh, private and visible only on the specific user. So as you can see, something very simple. Uh, you have to consider that the project ended in the 2018, so three years ago. And uh, it's, it was quite surprising that uh, uh, the app has been uh, used a lot in the last year. Uh, we did not, you know, at the end of the project, usually when you do something, uh, it's uh, it's quite common that's you know the uh, the 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 solution uh, you know die away with the end of the project but in this case there was really a lot of interest as you can see this is not something complex it's something very basic but it has been uh, used a lot in uh, several locations uh, all you know we had about uh, 1800 spade tests uh, you know only uh, 30 40 percent of this they are complete there are a lot of people that are using download the app and just uh, enter a few data just to look what it is but uh, it has been used a lot uh, our impression about the type of user there will be mainly connected with the uh, um, training center uh, for farmer or for student or university but there are also a lot of agronomists that are using the app within uh, uh, several local projects to uh, teach uh, the farmer uh, how important is the soil and also to start 
to, to push the farmer to look at the soil condition and to start to think about uh, how the practices affect the soil. This was the main results also with the, with the user. Uh, you know, it is not, a, a, the app is just a, a push people to spend 20 minutes on looking, looking on their soil and to think about this. And this has been useful uh, for farmer, for students to start to figure out uh, what was the results of their uh, solution. Uh, and in the last year, there was uh, a few universities started to use it a lot. So we had uh, this year, we have more uh, uh, data than previous year. So it is growing this type of uh, completely unorganized uh, community. And uh, we are thinking about some uh, extension. Uh, there was a, a, a test that we made with, with, uh, with uh, the first user about humic balance. Uh, um, this will be really interesting to evaluate the practices and to make such uh, medium term uh, forecast of what can be the, the, the soil organic matter balance and how the practices, if the practice they have done, uh, like uh, cover crops and uh, organic fertilizer balance, uh, the, the mineralization. And so this is a, a first step. At the moment, this is not uh, available for a normal user. Uh, it requires some activity to start to grow up uh, a vocabulary of practices and presets data just to simplify the data entry for the user. And then an, an interesting thing was about the, the QBSC. The QBSC has been a methodology developed by Silvia Fusaro from University of Padua. Uh, we contacted her through, you know, the, the, um, she looked at the app and then we had some discussion. This is an interesting tool. Uh, this is a, a bit more uh, complicated than, uh, than soil up, but it does not require some specific knowledge and uh, also some specific uh, tools. It is uh, an index that can be done. Uh, you don't need to define what will be the species, but you need only a functional classification of earthworm. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a dichotomic uh, uh, key that can support to define any time that you see an, an earthworm what will be the functional group. And then at the end, you have an index calculator and the, the first analysis get, give you, there is a good correlation of this index with, uh, bio, with biodiversity and uh, agrobiodiversity practices in farm level. So this can be also an interesting uh, uh, solution. The idea is that the app is open source, is available on the uh, GitHub. So it can be interesting also to involve and other developer to work together with this. And uh, this can be a starting point or integrate with also other similar solution to create, you know, a training ground and to grow uh, using uh, one, uh, one topic. You know, you know, pest management is very cross specific. There is very specific. Soil management, it's easier and it can involve uh, uh, more uh, type of farmer. And so this can be a, a step that can be used to involve other communities and to start to grow something a bit more uh, complex or something a bit more that can provide more uh, support to, to farmer. And uh, thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you, Diego. So uh, we can may pass to the next uh, speaker, which is Emanuel Ranieri from Agricolus. Uh, yes, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, first of all, thank you all to hosting me in this series of webinar. Thank you. Uh, my name is Emanuele Ranieri, and I am an entomologist and a data scientist uh, in Agricolus. Um, basically, my job is to handle, manage, analyze uh, a big set of data from agriculture, the so-called big data, uh, to produce uh, precision farming services solutions. Um, uh, Today, what I'm going to show is a, it's a very brief overview of what a precision agriculture uh, tool like Agricolus is um, can do for agroecology. Okay, first of all, uh, what is Agricolus? Agricolus, uh, first of all, it's uh, it's a bulk of people. It's a bulk of different uh, competencies um, made up of data analysts. Uh, 
uh, IT developers, agronomists, of course, uh, business developers, um, working all together to produce the best tool, the best solution for farmers, for, for technician to um, handle uh, precision farming uh, uh, instruments. Um, for our perspective, the, the best tool is, the, is a web cloud, is a cloud-based platform uh, that make um, a technician, the end user, able to, um, to use a lot of tools of precision farming, like satellite indices, uh, remote sensing, crop scouting, uh, digital solutions, sensors, a mathematical model for pest and disease management, irrigation, nutrition, and many others. Um, so uh, here the big question is uh, uh, what can be done to change this paradigm to, to shift from a um, very traditional agribusiness uh, view of agriculture to a more sustainable one through precision farming. Um, agroecology is, is a very, very wide uh, um, terms. Uh, and uh, contains a lot of things inside, but uh, in the perspective of reduce input uh, and preserve the, the, the environment, the, the ecology, um, smart farming solutions uh, as agriculus natively is born to uh, intervene surgically when some problems arises. So for us, uh, have a bulk of mathematical models, for example, to manage irrigation or nutrition or treatments. It doesn't mean just, just monitor the, your field from a distance. It doesn't mean just save time and money. It means interve intervene in the field just when the field needs it and save yes money, but um, put less input in the environment. And preserve the ecosystem. Um, so um, what we believe is that the first step to start is to inform people because um, our end user usually are skeptical or less informed about what precision agriculture can do. So Agriculus is uh, continuously involved in classes, in organizing, in organizing classes, even with COVID pandemic situation. Uh, to inform and make end user touch with the fingertips with data, um, wh what can be actually done. And wh what's the best way to inform them? Uh, by, we strongly believe that um, to, to help this transition to, to achieve a good results in agroecology, we need to monitor what's happening in the farm. So um, we even no, uh, we integrate. We are integrating in our platform uh, a set of KPI indices uh, to monitor what's happening actually in the field, uh, in the farms, generally speaking. So we uh, we can have social, economical, environmental indicators. That altogether, it's a, a very important overview of, of of your behavior actually. And it's important uh, for a comparison year by year to understand this kind of transition to a more sustainable way of farming. But it's also important uh, to have an internal benchmark. In this term is precision farming because uh, it's not just at farm level, but you can also go and investigate field by field, crop by crop, what's happening. For example, you can see uh, what's your water nutrient efficiency or nutrition, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus use efficiency, what is your crop diversity, and many, many others. We, we, integrate, we are integrating something like 20 different KPI for this. And this is to inform the farmers. Uh, to inform the end user and the farmers too, uh, we are developing a tool for traceability. So what is a, a tool for traceability? We, we developed now the technology is mature enough to, to integrate something that can track your product from, from, the, pack, from the seeding to the packaging. We developed some techno uh, this technology in Tobacco and we are now trying to uh, move these technologies to other crops like oranges and many, many other. And at the end, we, we are able to, to, 
to reconstruct the, the history of the products from the packaging, connecting the people, the machinery, the crop operation. So how many treatments, how many water was used to produce this, this product and even the roots and the time in a very, very easy way, actually. So another very important things from our perspective that involve us in a project, uh, it's uh, the um, unexploited area management. Uh, we know that traditional farming just focus on the field, of course, but there is a surrounding environment that it's very, very important. Now listing all the benefits from uh, from the surrounding area management, uh, it's it's uh, it's going to take twice the time of this presentation. But it is very important for biodiversity, for carbon sequestration, for uh, prevent erosion, uh, to control even uh, pe field pests, crop pests. But uh, um, how to um, monitor uh, at the best this, this area and how to calculate the, the contribution of this area. And this is something that is actually feasible with, with models and with remote sensing scouting. And this introduced me to another, uh, another topic that actually we are carrying on, that is crop planning and rotation. And this is actually is not a big news because farmers rotating crop since millenniums maybe, but uh, doing it with ratio in a data-driven way, it's not so easy. Then now uh, we are able, for example, to estimate the nitrogen residual for, from previous crop or the humic balance of the, the field. And this is uh, all together our uh, information that are critical in, in, in our wise crop planning or, co or co cropping. Um, yeah, talking about reducing input without talking about soil is pretty senseless because soil is the container where all the inputs and outputs basically move. And what we are doing now is the developing an algorithm that through remote sensing satellite uh, is able to detect uh, the, the water and clay content of the soil. So to build up a texture map of the seal field, basically like this one is. So for example, here is a um, 10 per 10 meters uh, grid map uh, built just with uh, satellite images without uh, any sampling in the field with a clear trend, uh, southwest, uh, uh, northwest, southeast of clay content, for example. And then we test the real field situation, mapping the electrical conductivity. And we found actually a very, very good correlation between these two. So uh, this kind of tool in terms of reducing the input, uh, in terms of irrigation, for example, or manage wisely the, the, the seeding or, or, or just to monitor soil status is critical. And also if we couple this kind of technology with something that Diego before mentioned, that is a humic balance that uh, let us understand coupled with mapping uh, all the dynamics of the soil in terms of uh, soil organic matter. And, and again, uh, improve the value of data, it's, it's critical because uh, nowadays we produce tons, billions and billions of data in agriculture, but are sometimes barely exploited. And for example, this is a um, yield map of wheat that was used by the farmers to produce through an algorithm, the forecasting model of, next, uh, of the next uh, yield. And based on this uh, was produced uh, a prescription map for nitrogen. And he, des he decided basically to fertilize less where the yield was higher. And, and he actually uh, saved from 10 to 40% of nitrogen. That is, that is good. Last but not least, just because I'm an entomologist, uh, I'm, it's something that we worked uh, with, a Finland, uh, with a Finnish group that is use alternative sources of environment monitoring. Um, this is why the, to choose alternative sources of monitoring. Uh, first of all, because uh, something like bees and honeybees 
are part of the environment itself and their safety and wellness it's it's super important then second because it's um, they allow us to measure something that it's very hard to to measure uh, with other tools like uh, pesticide residuals or heavy metals and so on and then mo most important um, they scout an area of two kilometers from the beehives and now the and, and now what we are trying to do is build a web of beehives, uh, giving us a lot of information about the environment covered by the web. So uh, the topic beyond the, the normal precision farming are a lot, but what, what, what I uh, try to give is just one take home message that it's a legacy of my professor that always told me, um, don't fight the data. If the data tell you something, trust the data, don't trust yourself. So thank you very much. Well, I thank you also, Manuel, for the very interesting uh, presentation about the uh, practical implementation, especially in the case of uh, big data. So I will now uh, give the floor to Alekos Padazis. So I guess now Alekos will give us more, let's say, traditional kind of technological uh, technologies and tools. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So uh, I will be speaking about uh, the concept of design globally and manufactured locally, about building open source tools for small scale uh, farming. So. We will be uh, talking around the concepts of design global and manufactured local, about open source agriculture, and about technological sovereignty. And uh, those concepts uh, around the heart of uh, what we call the commons. But uh, what is a commons? Commons is a, a sphere which uh, starts uh, entering between uh, the sphere of the state or the public sphere and the private sphere. The, the public sphere is when who manages a place uh, is uh, the state. And the private sphere is that who, who manages and set the rules of the place is, are the owners of the place. So commoning is a different concept of doing things where the ones who manage the, the space or the sense or the data or the tools or anything you can imagine is the community itself. It's the set of communities that are affected uh, positively or negatively from this resource. So it's a, a, at the heart of commons is a community. So commons ha has three, three pillars, um, a resource. Uh, let me see how I can point. Okay, no, give me a second. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse. So there is three pillars, the resource, the community, and the set of rules that the community sets in order to manage this resource. And uh, in all the times, uh, and in general, commons can uh, have to do with nature or with community or with culture, like the common grazing uh, lands or the common uh, routes that uh, the community regulates on how to and when and how much wood uh, should they take, or the common uh, pasture, or uh, the culture. You know that the the traditional songs that we don't they don't have one uh, creator or owner. Um, but uh, what happens in the case of contemporary technology? So what we have the last decades is the revitalization around the discussion of the commons, uh, and one of the reasons is the digital commons, uh, where we have a collective management and creation from users that are not only profit driven of it as it is in the dominant system but for various other reasons which one of them is also the profit but it's not the only one so you all know i guess the wikipedia cyclopedia the linux operating system or the apache web server which are projects that have been developed by uh, volunteers and by the crowd, let's say, uh, and they are a lot of times uh, over overpassing on uh, on capabilities 
the ones that have been developed uh, on with the dominant uh, logic. So here we talk about the commons based peer production because peer production is when equals uh, communicate to produce something. But this, as it also been mentioned in some uh, articles of Vasilis, uh, is not always commons based. For example, YouTube or Facebook, it is a peer production because the users as horizontal forms can collaborate and create value. But what happens in the back end, who, who collects the data and who gets the profit, it's not a commons based process. So this is the difference between the commons based peer production. So we wondered what will happen if on this uh, successful paradigms of uh, digital commoning, we could add a lo the local manufacturing. And there we, we have what we call design global manufacture local. So there is the case of a wiki house of open bionics, prosthetic hand, or of in the, in the case of agriculture that I'm going to be speaking today, uh, the Paysan and the Jamaica's cases. So here we go back to what Vasilis uh, discussed about user innovation, uh, that it is based on the community, this type of, of uh, technology development and artifacts development. And it is also horizontal in the sense of a peer-to-peer uh, uninterrupted collaboration. So what we have here, so the thing is that we can have the digital commons served as a global uh, good, uh, outside of uh, property rights and of artificial scarcity. So we can share the knowledge, the design or the code uh, globally and freely, and we can have a local uh, manufacturing. And when we say digital commons, this can be, can include various types uh, and, and levels. So it is the knowledge around the tool as a commons. So how we can design uh, the tool, uh, what are the raw materials that we need or the use of the tool but it can be also the knowledge about the process of making a tool as a common. So how Makerspace community runs the protocols of it, as we have to know how a, 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 a mainstream factory, let's say, world, works. This is also a very precious knowledge. And then on the local manufacturing level, we can have a, a, as a commons, the tools that you need to make the construction, right? So everybody can use a welding machine. So not all the village, each house in the village has to buy one. Okay, so we have a sharing manufacturing machinery. And also we can have the tools that are constructed by the community to be treated as a commons. So shared uh, tools that are manufactured by the community. And there are various cases. This is, it is, a, it is again in a seed form, this type of production that we are studying, but not uh, very, very marginal. So there are big cases of, uh, of uh, this kind of, uh, of artifacts, like uh, a prosthetic hand, uh, where the, the design is shared globally as a Creative Commons license. And then you can manufacture it with a simple or a, and, and a little bit more sophisticated tools like a 3D printer, but in general, it has a, a simple materials or the design uh, and the instructions about an agricultural tool that can be manufactured locally or the, the designs of a, of a wind turbine that can be uh, manufactured locally. And all those cases are, are happening. We have uh, collaborators that build uh, small scale wind, wind turbines in, in India, in Africa to help local um, hospitals there, etc. And the same goes for the prosthetic hand. And all of these solutions usually are in fraction of the, of the market price. So um, what we have, uh, what we would want to, to examine is how uh, the knowledge at the core uh, that can be designed knowledge or software can be shared globally uh, as a global uh, digital commons, and then the making can take place uh, locally. Let me go uh, straight forward into two cases. So L'Atelier Paysan uh, is an is a auto construction cooperative for France. And sorry, and Jumakers uh, is a rural maker space in northern Greece uh, to which I'm heavily uh, involved. So, uh, L'Atelier Paysan have a, a van uh, going around the French villages and seeking for uh, farmers' innovations. Then discuss with the inventor, and if he agrees, they upload the, the first idea and the design on the forum. 
uh, where the, the inventor discusses the reasons uh, that uh, he did it and how it works, etc. And if there is interest from the community, then the, the Atelier Paysan organize a prototyping workshop when they, they create a copy of the tool. And then the tool has to be tested for at least one year in the, on the field, making the proper uh, improvements. And only if the tool proves useful, uh, then they do the more proper designs, which are uploaded on a, a library of L'Atelier Paysan, which is uh, free under Creative Commons. Um, and then if an association want to use this tool, calls to makers which go there and they set up a workshop in which uh, the, farmers and the farmers themselves participate in the construction of the tool. This is a totally different set and, and logic on developing a technology which involves heavily uh, the users and the farmers and has a very different um, effects on, on this. So the philosophy is that the development of tools um, uh, and self-built machinery can happen from the same communities. Thus, the farmers can collectively develop solutions which are adapted to their own needs and technology needs uh, can be collectively reclaimed to serve those who use it. So uh, a lot of times, especially in small scale farming, we have huge tools that are designed for industrial uh, farming that does not fit uh, to the pr production of the farmer and the farmer has to be adapted to the tool and not on the opposite that the tool should be adapted to the farmer apart from the, uh, from the high price, uh, high costs of these tools and the control on these tools. It's known the, the, the big issue with the tractors in the United States, for example, where uh, farmers does, does not own the tool because everything is electronically controlled and if the tractor uh, has a problem, the, the farmer cannot fix it. He has only to go uh, to the official uh, uh, retailer. And the vision is a technological sovereignty. Uh, so starting from the concept, let's say, of the seed sovereignty, it is a very similar uh, philosophy of uh, the community and the farmers that produces to be uh, on command of their own technology. And uh, they say that we value the process as long as the final tool. tool. So it is important that the final tool is functional, but uh, it is at the same extent uh, important, the process. So we have uh, two cases that uh, we are running under the, in, um, a set of EU funded projects that help us to develop uh, those, uh, those, maker, those rural maker spaces, uh, getting inspired from La Tele Paysan and the uh, farm hack in the United States. So Jewmakers is in Greece, and we have also, uh, at its starting now, uh, Neandrel Zosa, a cooperative makerspace in Bhutan, trying to, to, to make synergies and see how this, really this model of design global and manufacturing local can, can function. So it is uh, on Northern Greece here on the right, you can see the, the building, which is a municipal building. And this is the name of the project uh, and the Jewmakers community. So we want to see Jamaica's community as, a, as an independent community that has been grown with the help of the project, but uh, can continue uh, to function. Here are some photos of the, of the place, so some basic tools for uh, metal working and wood working. Uh, another picture of the, of the place. The set of, uh, of classical, let's say, uh, tools uh, for a lab. Uh, and also we have a, a room for, uh, for electronics like uh, open source uh, motherboards, sensors, etc. So this community, we, we went there and discussing with the community, opening up the ideas. It is a rural mountainous community that people are used to uh, hacking and, um, and uh, repairing their own tools. So it was uh, quite easily uh, perceived this concept, but on the, on the other side, it is difficult to persuade farmers or animal breeders or, or beekeepers, et cetera, uh, in the concept of collectively uh, creating the tools. So there are, at the same time, there are quite close communities. So for example, somebody might say, nice idea, I go to make it on my basement, right? Here is a picture from our first tool. There is a different actors, like for example, uh, he's uh, the, the president of the, of the village. He is an owner of a mountain shelter, shelter. He's a, he's a retired taxi driver. He's a farmer uh, and ex-political uh, um, economist. 
Um, he is, uh, those are collaborators and he's a kayak and a mountain um, uh, teacher on uh, hiking, etc. So different, different people, he is a, a, a woodworker and, and beekeeper. So different people can join from uh, web developers to local farmers and women, men, etc., cetera, or, uh, to participate in this uh, idea. And we also discussed with the community on what tools this uh, rural makerspace should have. So the process was open from the beginning. Here are some pictures of the making of tools. Here we did a, a project with a local uh, makerspace, uh, which is called Habibi Works, an amazing makerspace that is a, a nearby a, a refugees hotspot uh, in a Ioannina place. So we constructed a chicken, uh, a, a movable chicken coop, a solar dryer, and the and the weather station uh, together with, uh, with with the refugee community. And here is another case. Our bigger tool uh, is a is a inox uh, grinder for aromatic plants that uh, has been asked from some uh, producers that uh, they told us, look, in the, in the commerce, it is like an inox grinder costs twelve thousand euros or more. We heard about your community. Can you do something? So we get together and and finally uh, build uh, such a tool. So the process was first open up and discussion both in the Facebook group of posting ideas, people from different places, posting photos from similar tools that they have made. So this is a type of, of design global, asking the Atelier Paysan if they have an idea of such a tool, et cetera, and then discussing all together, uh, then organizing some meetings to design and, and discuss about the tool uh, from the material that we draw from the internet and from the connections that we could uh, energize. And then we start uh, in the period of around one year with uh, doing at least six uh, meetings in um, constructing the tool. And finally, the tool was functional. It is not 100% made. There are some uh, final parts of, of uh, um, separating the, the Regan, for example. Uh, but at this core, it is working. Those two are the, the one, two of the farmers that were interested. So it is still in an experimental and, and research stage, but it's an interesting uh, uh, project. So there are different uh, technical and social characteristics in this idea of design global manufacture local as a commons that I would like to point out. First of all, the tools are adapted to the local needs. So when a community designs a tool, uh, it always knows better its own needs and constraints. And also when the tool is open, if a different uh, community in different place of the world uh, sees the design and the ideas of the tool, can always adapt the tool to the local needs, uh, the local conditions, ground conditions, or community needs, et cetera, exactly because the, the design is open. Usually it is on the lower cost uh, for various reasons. Uh, for example, you don't need to pay for, for copyrights, uh, you don't uh, have the middleman, uh, or you can upcycle uh, by using local uh, iron or scrap iron or local wood, etc. Uh, often, a uh, lot of those uh, tools, uh, you cannot find them uh, in the commerce. They're usually made to last, so we don't have, uh, they, they also are repairable. So when a community designs something, it makes it the most robust that it can be. And also it makes it repairable. We all uh, are familiar, I guess, with cases that tools are made in such a way that if you try to repair them, you have to break them to open. So they are made purposely of not being repairable. A community design does not have any incentives to do that. And also we can have on-demand production. So we don't need to, to build a thousand of, of those tools waiting for, uh, for a warehouse uh, for, to, to sell them when there is the interest, but when somebody is interested, uh, he can uh, join in and, and build uh, one of those tools. And of course, the community does not have any incentive of, uh, of, uh, of using plant obsolescence. So tools, as I said, are made to last and are repairable and not to break after some, uh, some times of, of, of use. And also using common infrastructures, 
uh, is different technical characteristics, which all these characteristics has also uh, sustainability potential because you can use less tools, uh, buying less tools and less raw material. So the social characteristics is that uh, you, you render the technology accessible. So it is a different uh, trajectory of the alienation from technology or uh, seeing technolo the technology as a black box. So when the people can participate from a bigger uh, extent to a smaller extent, but they are there, they see, they can uh, start learning how, how to do that. Uh, you break this alienation that we all have uh, from technology and also uh, people can repair the tool afterwards if they have participated in making it or can make a new one. There is an empowerment of the producers and the citizens uh, when they feel that at least the percentage of the tool that they need, they can make them the themselves in the local maker space. I need two more minutes. I'm sorry, I'm reaching now the 20 minutes. So there is an empowerment of the producers or imagine a local producer that has uh, had the uh, designed and imagined the tool and uh, we, did, we, we construct this tool in Zoomakers and we open source its, uh, its uh, design. And then if he or she learns that another community in Latin America or in India uh, downloaded the designs and, 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 uh, and use this tool, and this tool helps this community, this is uh, an amazingly uh, empowering uh, case, right? And at the same time, uh, let me say here that this is the power of peer to peer collaboration because if a project draw the attention of the community if a project really speaks to the to the needs of the community then you can have hundreds or thousands of people from all, from all around the world downloading the designs experimenting putting new ideas improving the design and then giving back feedback uh, to the tool so you can have a very powerful set of practitioners of engineers of programmers that uh, outperform uh, sometimes the the uh, incorporations uh, tools. And of course, you have an inclusivity in the process. So thus a democratization of technology when uh, the process is open for everybody and the tools are designed for the local people. For example, a digging tool uh, was designed to the uh, bodies of the people that participated in the, in the workshop. And also in other case, we, we designed two different tools, one heavier and one lighter, so that also women can use it. So here comes a, an inclusivity philosophy. And coming back to what uh, Vasilis uh, described in, in his uh, first presentation, let me comment on uh, the data ownership. So uh, if uh, an app, as Diego also uh, described, is made open source and by the community, the data ownership is on the community itself and the, it does not draw to a multinational uh, using it for reasons that we might not know. Uh, the, con the control over technologies nests on the communities and on the horizontal collaboration in the global level of uh, those communities uh, instead of uh, nesting on the offices of some CEOs of uh, multinationals. <clears throat> the dependence from agronomists and now with a, a smart agriculture, uh, we'll start having a double dependence from the agronomist and from the IT specialist in instead of understanding their cultivations and their land and also understanding how to build their tools. The focus is on the local needs. There is a, a bottom-up approach instead of a, of a top-down. Uh, and uh, there is a, a community-based uh, approach instead of market-oriented, which we have seen largely the extractive results uh, when the developing of technologies uh, are market oriented, uh, while when the technologies are developed uh, focus, uh, with, a, with a focus on the community, uh, most uh, often we have regenerative uh, results. And on the, have a comment also on the high tech and low tech uh, people that we are speaking about mid tech, right? So we are not only in favor of the totally low tech, uh, but you can use nowadays sensors or uh, programming uh, in an open source way to be accessible to a mid type of technology. So you can have some high tech, a sensor or something, but then the tool is designed by the community in an open source and P2P way. So in this case, uh, we can talk, I think, about mid tech. And there's a different process 
of developing technologies in the heart of what I have described that I think that fits uh, with uh, agroecology. Uh, so uh, agriculture and agroecology must be conceived of as an ecological system as well as a human dominated socioeconomic system. So it's in this interconnection between the, the level of humans uh, interact with nature and with technologies that we cultivate and we produce our food and uh, can have a very important uh, connections between agroecology and uh, design global manufacturing local concepts. Thank you, thank you, thanks a lot. All right, uh, so I would also like to thank Alexo, Alekos for this very interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. I think it was really obvious how we're not talking only about digital innovation, but also other technological low tech, as it's called, uh, technologies that uh, they actually can be uh, adapted by communities and in order to develop their own uh, tools. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the set of presentation that's now closed. I would like to start now a little bit around the table, a joint discussion on the topic. I would like to start with um, a small, uh, small slide I have here. Just to show you, this is from another, actually, from another co from a conference where I was presenting a local uh, social cooperative in the southern part of Crete, Elite, I guess, which they are working on following agroecological principles. I would like to present this because if you notice the picture, the photograph in the middle with this uh, red uh, machine that you can see, this is a typical example really related to the concept that uh, the, the way of working that uh, Alex just described. I mean, there was a, a need there, a necessity. I mean, these people had to, had to harvest some peas, some legumes, but they didn't have the right tools to do it. So, and actually, there was nothing on the market that actually can cover these needs. So what they did, they tried to, having some basic knowledge that which was steamed, it was coming from the members of the community of the village they were living, they were they lived there, and they developed this very nice solution that it's actually a pea harvester, a harvesting legumes. So I guess it's like um, sometimes it's like the necessity that drives innovation. You see this, and so it's very important. The other thing that I would like to show you, I will try to do it now. Um, it's a recent article that I have read. I think we can see it here. I guess you can see it. It's, it was on a topic totally different. It was from the Psycho, based on the Aeon, Aeon magazine, if you know it. It actually was talking about how some traditional, even conservative communities, like the Amish, I guess you know them, they are living in uh, the United States. They're having a very conservative, close society, actually uh, apparently neglecting uh, the defying uh, technologies. They don't have cars, for example. However, following this uh, researcher, they say that this is actually not the truth. They say that they actually they do they do use technology, but the way they make, as you can see here, very slow decisions of how, as a collective, all together, if and how they're going to use it, and. Uh, so they don't, don't rush like directly with a great optimism to adapt to whatever technology, but they do it in a more cautious way, but let's say more skeptical. There was one phrase in the article that saying that it was a very basic thing. They say that there was a basic question to Andres. That is, does this technology serve the community purposes or not? So when Answer the, having this question and having the answer, then it was moving directly them towards if they will adapt this technology or not. I guess all this, as you can understand, is like uh, there is a lot of uh, food for thought here in many different aspects. I also would like to share my experience now that uh, having been in many different forums, like from the European Union, like the APAGRI meetings and working groups on new technologies that I see here also how reluctant, how farmers are sometimes very skeptical if they will invest some money for new technologies. And they are always afraid, let's say, that maybe this technology will not really deliver. Um, so what I would like to do, so I would like to ask uh, now uh, Diego and uh, Emanuela, like, let's say, representing the more digital aspects of uh, these technologies, of these innovations. And I would like to ask you, 
what do you believe it will be the next steps to be taken? I mean, within your work and working also with farmers. I mean, how do you see that uh, what under which framework should we collaborate with farmers in order to have technologies, digital, either digital or, uh, or even conventional, low tech, that uh, should work, work in this in a framework of, as it, uh, let's call it, agroecological one, also commons, either the uh, commons based or even peer to peer. So I would like to have the opinion of uh, Diego and Emanuele, and then of course also Alexis and, and of, and again, we are also open to address any other kind of um, position or opinion you would like to have. So let's start with Diego. I mean, I would like to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, it's, um, uh, um, you know, um, to have a, a tools that can be, that uh, it's used, the tools needs to work uh, fine. So uh, I think one of the main issue, because there are a lot of discussion about uh, uh, why farmers are not using the technology and so on. And I think that the first thing is that the technology should support farmers. And uh, I agree that one of the issues is that uh, a lot of technology are, are developed uh, to control farmer and not to support farmer. So I think this is a, a great issue that uh, digital solution, a lot of farmer are skeptical about digital solution because they see, okay, this is something to control me and this is not something that can support me. There is a, you know, there is a, the, the, the normal, you know, skeptical approach that a farmer has. And uh, I think it's good to be skeptical, uh, but uh, we need to be open. And uh, if we can show some, uh, solution that can support their own specific problem uh, they are quite open and they need to feel the solution as their that has been built following their own indication so i think it's uh, co-design is a critical approach then uh, we need to be aware that a lot of digital solution has been built by you know larger farm uh, food processor um, um, agrochemicals company. So this is something that's a, a bottom-up approach and also focusing the, you know, there, uh, the um, agroecology can be an environment where uh, you have a lot of farmers that are really committed and uh, they are willing to build something uh, from their own. Usually uh, can be a good area where uh, you can uh, develop or you can test some solution that can be uh, can be helpful to them and so um, um, this can be one solution you know uh, we need to establish a dialogue with the farmer we uh, you know uh, software or modelist or whatever uh, so uh, they want to test so they want to look something and they really like to criticize something. So <laughs> this is very interesting. So you can show something, they can say, no, I don't like this, uh, but uh, if you can change a bit, it will be better. So if we can establish this uh, approach, we can develop some solution that can feel useful for themselves. So this can be a win-win uh, approach. It will not be easy sometimes. You have to spend a lot of time, you know, meeting, and sometimes you have to say no because they want something that uh, it's it can support only their own specific problem. So you need the community. You cannot solve for the problem for one farmer. So we need some balance. But I think it's it's interesting to establish this dialogue. Yeah. Uh, yes, I I perfectly agree with Diego, hundred percent because uh, today there are two battles. One battle, one has to be fight against uh, the technology producer and we need to win that battle because we need to start talking with farmers and uh, put technology in front of farmers uh, in a very easy way. But the other battle is to, to be fight uh, um, against skepticism. I, I think skepticism, uh, it, it can be a good, uh, 
are good things, but in 2021, it's super easy to access information. And we have a, a very big lighthouse in front of us that is science and scientific publication. Uh, never in the history of humankind was so easy to access uh, reliable scientific publication. It was never so easy. And, uh, and it's a big resource, but it's not so easy to access by the end user, by the farmers. Uh, and so in, we need to be very, very good, for example, with webinar like this, to try to share this kind of information because data are there. We perfectly know now um, how much we save money, water, whatever you like. Uh, a lot of work has, has to be done, of course, but a lot of, of, of work has already carried out. And if you check publication in this topic, it is increasing year by year. And it's just a matter of information. Well, I don't have a lot of to, a lot of things to add. Uh, uh, Diego and Emmanuel, and Emmanuel uh, put it uh, boldly. Uh, only two comments on uh, starting from what Emmanuel said about the scientific knowledge. Imagine also another huge uh, lighthouse that uh, exists, which is the community knowledge. So there is uh, the, the practitioners' knowledge uh, ser shared openly. There is uh, in a different uh, various. Uh, levels of, of uh, communities and initiatives. And this is also a treasure. And uh, this also reduces, can reduce skepticism. So if in a farmer you can, you can say, I imagine that this tool has been developed from a rural community or in this place and helped with other also uh, farmers communities and they develop this tool, maybe they will feel more close, you know, to, to, to reduce the skepticism levels. <clears throat> And uh, the other comment is on uh, what Diego said, that uh, we, we need to have a tool that, that uh, works, which is uh, very much the case in most of the, of the cases. But uh, on the other side, I remember a, an interview of somebody in a makerspace saying that I've made this spoon and, uh, and it has broken four times and I repaired it. So people that participate in the making of tools Maybe tools will, might not be so perfect as the caterpillar, let's say, digging a tool or whatever, but they, they, get a, they have a connection with the tool, which is absent because of the alienation, alienation with the technology. But when somebody makes, builds a tool, it might be not perfect, but he's uh, tied with this and uh, maybe he would use it. Okay, for large scale producers or even for small scale producers, we need to have an, an efficiency. I'm not arguing on this. But just a small tip, you know, that maybe getting a humanized process in developing technology, even, you know, we can pay a price of not having perfect tools, but they can still be useful and clever because it has the, the community uh, common uh, creativity, let's say, embedded. I believe that there is a multitude now of very interesting opinions. Uh, I think now time is, uh, we're getting uh, out of time. Um, well, just to conclude here, I, I will uh, repeat again what Emanuele said. I mean, we're living in very interesting times. I mean, we do have uh, all, this, all these resources to move forward with and move towards how we would like to create all this, um, the world that we, how we want to build the tools, and how we want to build the communities that we're living with, especially when talking about agricultural communities. It, it's also obvious that it's a very big issue. It's go, it goes beyond agriculture. It embraces the whole uh, so, social structures and the social relations and uh, how societies are going to move forward. Uh, what I feel, what I hope, what I believe again is that um, that uh, in, in all this information that was uh, presented today here, all this very valuable opinions. I really say this, and I, uh, I mean it, that can really be the, let's say, this uh, think tank. I mean, these interactions, this is why we get online as well, to, to provide food for thought and also network and stimulate discussion and, of course, activities, actions on, uh, on this topic. So I really hope that uh, all this uh, discussion today will create the synergies 
for co-creation, as we said. So, all right. So I would really like to thank you all, Diego, Emanuel, and Aleko, for, very, for this very, very interesting uh, discussion. I believe this was one of the seminars, at least for my webinars, for my it is a personal opinion with maybe less participants in terms of audience, but really, really important in terms of uh, concepts and, uh, and, mean, and meanings that uh, were developed here. So thank you all. If you'd like to have a last word for something, I would really be glad to hear, uh, starting with Diego, Manuel, and then Aleko. No, I have nothing to add. Thank you very much for organizing this. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you. I hope next time we can see each other. <laughs> it's yes, a long time. I mean, we will not. <laughs> I mean, all right. Yeah. These <laughs> innovations are good, but uh, to bring people, I mean, I see you. I have not seen you for many years, but I hope, hope next time it will be in person. Why not? Maybe in the next Agroecology Europe Forum, which maybe yeah. it will be a good idea to see you there and have some something jointly organizing a workshop, maybe on this, on this concepts of innovations, technology, why not? And to so share really some seed, Puro. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, always, from Grappa as well. <laughs> so, really thank you all. I would I also like to, to thank the people participating in the attendance. And of course, this uh, webinar will be online for further uh, watching. So, have a nice evening, you all, and they will be in contact for anything further. See you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. 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 Bye.